In this lecture, we're going to talk about acetylcholine and its cholinergic receptors. We're going to talk about what the neurotransmitter does, what the receptors actually do, where they're found in the body, and then we'll finish off by talking about different medications that we can use that either stimulate or inhibit this receptor. Now, this will be a general overview of the topic. If you want the details, check out my website, and you can also download the lecture notes on my website. So let's begin with what exactly is acetylcholine? Well, acetylcholine is one of the major neurotransmitters used by the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now, we synthesize acetylcholine in our neurons, and we have an enzyme that, help us, uh, that helps us out. The enzyme is called choline acetyltransferase. So what choline acetyltransferase does is it combines a molecule of acetyl coenzyme A, so we have acetyl coenzyme A, and we basically combine that with choline. So this is a high energy bond, so we break the bond, we release the coenzyme A, the coenzyme A goes away, and we form acetylcholine, ACH. Now ACH is stored in vesicles at the terminal ends of neurons. So when action potential gets to that end, what happens is we release those vesicles, we release the acetylcholine, and it goes on and binds onto its target cell. But when we don't need acetylcholine in that synaptic cleft, it can be broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase or simply cholinesterase. So cholinesterase allows us to break down the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, thereby preventing its overactivity. And when we break it down back into acetylcoenzyme A and choline, these substances can be recycled, reabsorbed back into that terminal end of the neuron and recycled by that cell. Now, for acetylcholine to carry out its function, it has to bind to receptors. And the receptors that it binds to are known as cholinergic receptors. Now, we have two different types of cholinergic receptors. We have nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. Now, don't get confused by the names. We call these nicotinic receptors because back in the day when we were studying them, nicotine was able to bind to these receptors. Likewise, back in the day when we were studying these receptors, we found that an agent called muscarin also was able to bind to these receptors. And so now we call these nicotinic receptors, we call these muscarinic receptors, but really these are just two different types of cholinergic receptors. They both bind acetylcholine. So what's the difference between these two receptors? Well, nicotinic receptors are ligand gated ion channels. In contrast, muscarinic receptors are transmembrane proteins, so they're not ion channels. They're transmembrane proteins that are coupled to a G protein on the intracellular side of that transmembrane protein. So we call them G protein coupled receptors. So let's begin with the nicotinic receptors. So again, these are ligand gated ion channels. So what happens is when acetylcholine binds onto the nicotinic receptor, it creates an opening in the central portion of that channel, thereby allowing ions to flow in. For example, allowing sodium to flow in. And we have two subtypes of nicotinic receptors. We have N1 and N2. The more important one, for this lecture at least, is N1. So N1 is located on the skeletal muscle at the neuromuscular junction. So it's used by the somatic nervous system. We also have N2, but that's found on neurons. For example, we find it on, post, on the cell body of postganglionic, parasympathetic, and sympathetic cells. So here and here. But this is the least important one. The N1 is the more important one for this lecture. So let's suppose we're at the neuromuscular junction. So here we have the terminal end of the neuron. Here we have the synaptic cleft. And here we have the membrane of that skeletal muscle. So here we have vesicles containing a bunch of acetylcholine. Action potential propagates the terminal end. It stimulates calcium channels and that ultimately allows the release of these vesicles via exocytosis. And so now we have acetylcholine that goes on and binds 
onto N1 nicotinic receptors. So remember, N1 nicotinic receptors are found at the neuromuscular junction on the skeletal muscle. And so when two acetylcholine molecules bind onto this receptor, it opens up the channel and allows sodium to move down its electrical chemical gradient into the cell. And that makes the inside of the cell more positive, that depolarizes the cell, and that causes contraction in that skeletal muscle. Now, to prevent over-contraction, too much contraction, we have that acetylcholinesterase in the synaptic cleft to break down that acetylcholine and keep it in check. And then the acetylcholine, uh, the acetyl-CoA and, and, uh, and the choline can be reabsorbed back into that terminal end and then recycled and reused by that cell. So, the first lesson is Nicotinic receptors, which are cholinergic receptors, are important component of the somatic nervous system. So we see that the somatic nervous system uses acetylcholine. So to move our skeletal muscles, we need acetylcholine. Then we move on to the muscarinic receptor. So these are G-protein coupled receptors. And what that means is, so here we have a cell membrane. And here we have a G-protein coupled receptor. So it's a transmembrane receptor on the, so this is the outside and this is the inside. On the outside, we have a pocket that binds acetylcholine. So when acetylcholine binds, on the inside, we have a G-protein. When the ACH binds, it creates a conformational change that in turn activates the G-protein, and that G-protein, depending on what pathway it uses, can either excite the cell or it can inhibit the cell. We're not going to get into the detail of the different types of pathways that are used, but basically we either use the GQ pathway or the GI pathway, and we'll come back to this in just a moment. So. Muscarinic receptors, there are five different subtypes. So we have two types of nicotinic and five types of muscarinic. So M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. Luckily M4, and, uh, luckily, M4 and 5, we don't really know too much about, so we know they're located in the brain, but typically these aren't important in the sense that they're never actually tested. But M1, M2, and M3 are important because these are tested. So. M1, M2, and M3. M1 and M, uh, M1 and M3 use the GQ pathway. So if we go back to this diagram, for M1 and M3, the inside protein is GQ. And so when acetylcholine binds, it activates GQ, and GQ actually excites the cell. So it increases production of secondary messenger molecules, and that ultimately excites the cell. So whatever that effect or cell is, it will increase its activity. In contrast, the M2 uses a GI protein, and a GI protein is inhibitory in nature. It will decrease production of secondary messenger molecules. So, and more specifically, when we activate this, GI goes on and inhibits adenylate cyclase that decreases production of cyclic AMP, which is a secondary messenger molecule, and that inhibits the cell. And so GI follows the inhibitory pathway. So M1 and M3 follow the, uh, the excitatory pathway, and then M2 follow this inhibitory pathway. Now, where do we find M1, M2, and M3? Now, by, this is not an extensive list. I've only included the things that I think you really have to know. M1 is found predominantly in the central nervous system, so in areas like the cortex of the brain. We also find it in places like the salivary glands and gastric glands, but that's not that important. So. M2 is found in the heart, so this is the one you have to know. It's found in the atria of the heart and in the cells making up the conduction pathway of the heart. And then we also find M2s in the smooth muscle of the bladder, but again, that's uh, the least important one. And then we have M3, and M3 is the biggie. So this one is found essentially throughout the visceral organs and tissues of the body. So this is the one that is used by the parasympathetic nervous system to basically maintain homeostasis in the body. 
we find M3 in all the different types of exocrine glands, so salivary glands. We find it in um, lacrimal glands, in gastro glands, in pancreatic glands, and so forth. We find it in the smooth muscle of the eye, and we'll come back to that. We find it in the lungs, in the smooth muscle of the lungs, in the smooth muscle of the GI tract, in the smooth muscle of the bladder. So, as you can see, M3 is important. So, M1, central nervous system, M2, the heart, and M3, basically everywhere else. And so, if we summarize what we talked about so far, we see that acetylcholine, which uses nicotinic and muscarinic receptors, is, is, is used predominantly by the somatic nervous system to help us move, and the parasympathetic nervous system to basically maintain homeostasis of the organs and tissues in the body. So, as an example, let's take M3. What happens if acetylcholine binds to M3? Well, if it binds to M3 in the exocrine glands, it will stimulate those glands to increase production. So we're gonna produce more tears, we're gonna produce more saliva, we're gonna produce more gastric acid, we're gonna produce more secretions in the airways, we're gonna produce more secretions by the pancreas, and so forth. When M3 binds in the eye, it constricts the pupil and it also stretches out the lens. We'll come back to that in just a moment. When M3, um, when, acetyl, uh, when acetylcholine binds to M3 in the lungs, it causes bronchoconstriction because it constricts those uh, smooth muscles and it also increases secretion of the airways. When acetylcholine binds to M3 in the GI tract, it increases motility and secretions. And when it binds in the bladder, it causes the bladder to basically contract and empty urine. And again, we'll come back to all of this in just a moment. But M2, which is, uh, which is inhibitory in nature, so when acetylcholine binds to M2, it inhibits the cells. And so, for example, the cells of the conduction pathway conduct action potential throughout the heart. And so when acetylcholine binds to M2, it will decrease conduction speed, thereby decreasing the heart rate, and that can cause bradycardia. In the atria, it will decrease the contraction. But notice that the ventricles don't really have M2, only the atria, and so the ventricles aren't really affected. And so let's summarize what we talked about by looking at the following diagrams. So again, acetylcholine is crucial in the somatic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. In the somatic nervous system, so we have the alpha motor neuron coming from the spinal cord and the terminal end is at the effector skeletal muscle. And so we release acetylcholine from the vesicles. It binds onto nicotinic type one. That's an ion channel, causes an influx of sodium, causing an action potential in the skeletal muscle, causing contraction. So that allows us to actually move. And so if you imagine, if we have a lot of acetylcholine here, our muscles are gonna twitch or fasciculate. We're gonna have too much contraction. What about the parasympathetic nervous system? So we have the pre and the post ganglionic cells. The pre ganglionic cell uses acetylcholine and the N2 this receptor here that we didn't really talk about. And then it creates an action potential and eventually ACTH is also used by this junction. And here we have muscarinic receptors. Remember we have M1 in the central nervous system, M2 in the heart and M3 basically everywhere else. So this is the visceral tissue and organ. And then I wanna briefly mention that actually the sympathetic nervous system which uses for the most part uh, norepinephrine at this junction actually uses acetylcholine in the sweat gland. So this is the only place that we use acetylcholine at this junction for the sympathetic nervous system. So when we increase ACH in the body, it actually increases the production of sweat, but this is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. So. To summarize, let's talk about the effects of acetylcholine. And one way you can memorize it is by remembering this mnemonic. So dumbbells with one L and two S's. So the D in dumbbells stands for diarrhea. Why? Well, again, we have M3 receptors which are stimulatory in nature in the smooth muscle um, of the GI tract, the gut. And so this will increase the peristalsis, increase the motility, and also increase secretions. And so this can cause diarrhea if we have too much ACH.
U stands for urination. Why? Well, again, to come back to this discussion here, we have M3 receptors in the detrusor smooth muscle of the wall of the bladder. And so if we stimulate them, that will cause contraction of that wall and that will cause emptying of that urine in the bladder. And so that will cause urination. M stands for meiosis. So this I want to talk about. So in the eye, we have a muscle. So here we have the pupil. So we're looking into the eye. So this is the pupil, which is basically an opening in the eye. And around the pupil, we have a muscle called the sphincter muscle. So we have the pupillary sphincter muscle, which is a circular muscle right around the pupil. And so when the circular muscle contracts, as you, uh, as you can imagine, if it contracts, it squeezes on the pupil and it basically decreases the opening. And this is known as meiosis. So these muscles have the M3 receptor. And so that's stimulatory. So when ACH is increased, it binds to M3. That causes constriction of this muscle, decreasing the size of the pupil. And so this is what we call meiosis. The opposite of meiosis is medriasis, but meiosis means it becomes smaller. And so we're going to see pupil constriction. Likewise, in the eye, we have something called the ciliary body. So here we have the lens of the eye. So we're looking at the lens from the side. And the lens, or we have a muscle that attaches to the lens called the ciliary body or the ciliary muscles. And these are also smooth muscles. And here we also have M3. And so what happens is when ACH binds to M3 at the ciliary body, it causes them to contract. And so when they contract, it causes elongation of that lens. And so this is important in a process called accommodation. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about the eye. So if we essentially do this, this basically means we're going to elongate that lens. And so the M stands for meiosis. We have M3 in the pupillary sphincter muscle in the ciliary body. So that will cause pupil constriction and uh, lens elongation. The B stands for bronchoconstriction. So remember, in the airways, we have M3s on a smooth muscle. When we activate them, that causes them to contract, and that causes bronchoconstriction, constriction of those bronchioles. In addition, we increase airway secretions in the airway, in the lungs and other areas of the airway. The other B stands for bradycardia, and this is because of M2. So again, this is inhibitory, so we're going to decrease the heart rate, and that can cause bradycardia. The E stands for excitation. And so this includes M1 receptors in the brain. Remember, we have M1, which are excitatory in, this, in, in the cortex of the central nervous system. And excitation also means we have more muscle movement because we have those nicotinic N1 receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So this will cause things like muscle twitching and muscle fasciculations if we have too much ACH. The L stands for lacrimation, the S stands for salivation, and the S stands, the second S stands for sweating. So basically everything in the body that can uh, release fluid will release fluid. And so one way to remember the activity of acetylcholine is it causes everything in the body to leak. All the exocrine glands begin to leak. And so L lacrimation, because we have M3 in the lacrimal glands, increases tear production. S salivation, because we have actually M1 and M3, remember, uh, salivary glands, M1 and M3, but M3 are the major ones. And so that can cause things like drooling. And then the sweating, this one actually is, is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, but it also uses the muscular receptors. And so that's found in the sweat glands, causes diaphoresis. So dumbbell is a great way to remember the effects of too much acetylcholine in the body. And so this leads us to medications and drugs. So I've broken it down into cholinomimetics and anticholinergics. So let's begin with cholinomimetics. Cholinomimetics are medications that mimic the activity of acetylcholine. Hence, we call it cholinomimetics. And they bind onto cholinergic receptors. And this includes both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors.
So we have medications and then we have toxins. So medications can be broken down to two types of medication. So we have two types of cholinomimetics. We have direct agonists and we have indirect agonists of cholinergic receptors. Direct agonist means the medication binds directly to that acetylcholine receptor, thereby stimulating it. Indirect agonists work a little different. They work on that cholinesterase enzyme in the cleft that breaks down acetylcholine. So they bind onto cholinesterase, decrease its activity, and that will increase levels of ACH in the cleft. And so now we have more ACH available to bind onto cholinergic receptors. So that's why we call them indirect because they work through this cholinesterase. So let's talk about the direct agonist medications. We have medications such as bethanacol, carbacol, pilocarpine, and methacholine. Again, we're not going to talk about the details. If you want to learn more about them, uh, go to my website. But very briefly, bethanacol is a medication that works pr uh, predominantly in the gut and the bladder. And so bethanacol binds to M3 receptors in the gut. And because it's an agonist, it will stimulate M3 receptors and that will increase peristalsis in the gut. And so this is useful in patients who have undergone procedures, so surgeries, and develop post-operative ileus. So ileus means the gut isn't working very well because of inflammation caused by the surgery. And so as long as we don't have an obstruction in that gut, we can give them uh, this medication and that can help with movement in the gut. And then in the bladder, it will increase the motion of the bladder, basically causing emptying of the bladder. And this is useful in, in non-obstructive postpartum ilia. So um, in patients who are postpartum, their bladder could basically not work uh, very well because all that inflammation as a result of that delivery process. And so we can give them bethanacol. Then we have carbocol. So carbocol works pre uh, predominantly in, in M3 in the eye. And what it does is it stimulates those ciliary body muscles and it stimulates um, those pupillary sphincter muscles so it can cause meiosis and it can cause uh, lens elongation. And this can actually be used in patients with glaucoma. Likewise, pilocarpine can also be used in patients with glaucoma. So what it does is it binds to M3 in the eye and does the same exact thing. And then we have methacholine. This binds to M3 in the lungs. And uh, methacholine is only really used to help, diagnosis, uh, to help diagnose asthma. There's something called the methacholine challenge test. So in patients with asthma, they have hyperreactive airways and they will have an exaggerated response to methacholine. So if a patient has asthma and they inhale methacholine, the methacholine will bind into M3 receptors, stimulating them, causing exaggerated uh, bronchoconstriction. And that can be used to make the diagnosis of asthma. Then we have indirect agonists. Again, these inhibit cholinesterase, increasing ACH. And we have medications such as edrophonium, we have neo, pyrido, physostigmine, so these all end in stigmine. So we have neostigmine, uh, pyridostigmine, and physostigmine. Now, neostigmine and pyridostigmine are both, they're very similar, they're both used in the treatment of myasthenia gravis. So we'll talk more about that later on. And then physostigmine uh, is the only one that actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and so can penetrate the central nervous system. And so for that reason, physostigmine can be used in patients who have atropine toxicity or anticholinergic toxicity. We'll talk more about that uh, later on. And then we have donepazil, uh, galactamine, and rivastigmine. All these medications can penetrate into the central nervous system. And so for this reason, they're used in the treatment of symptoms in dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease. And then, so that ends the medications. And then we have toxins. So we have organophosphates, which are pesticides or, uh, or insecticides. And so patients, for example, farmers who deal with these organophosphates can develop organophosphate poisoning, which basically means they have too much acetylcholine in the body. 
And then we can also have nerve gases, and these are used either in war or by terrorists. So that's cholinomimetics. And then we have anticholinergics, which do the opposite of cholinomimetics. So these substances block the activity of cholinergic receptors, but they only work on muscarinic receptors. They don't actually work on nicotinic receptors. And so for this reason, we also call anticholinergics muscarinic antagonists. So we have medications and we have toxins. Let's begin with medications. The prototypical medication that is an anticholinergic is atropine. So atropine is a naturally occurring medication that is found in the belladonna plant. And so every other medication is basically a derivative of atropine in some form. So atropine, if used systemically, can basically work on any of these receptors. So it can work on the receptors in the eyes, lungs, heart, GI, and GU. So remember, we're talking about muscarinic receptors here. So if atropine works on the eye, remember, these inhibit the activity of muscarinic receptors. So if atropine, were, uh, if atropine works on the eyes, for example, it will bind to M3, inhibiting M3. And so that means, if we come back to this discussion here, we have M3 in the sphincter muscle, and so if we block them, that will open up the pupil, and that is known as medriasis. So medriasis. So that will open up the pupil, and it will also block M3 in the ciliary body, causing paralysis of the ciliary body muscles, and that is known as cycloplegia. So we'll come back to this when we talk about tropicamide. When atropine binds in the lungs, it will dilate the airway, and it will also decrease secretions in the lungs. When it binds to the heart, it will increase the heart rate because it will block those M2 receptors. When it binds in the GI, it will decrease motility and secretion. When it binds to the GU, so the bladder, it will decrease the contraction of the bladder and that can cause urinary retention. So let's talk about some of these derivatives of atropine. So for example, we have scopolamine. Scopolamine and benztropin actually act in the central nervous system predominantly, so in the M1. Scopolamine, what it does is it actually decreases the communication between the vestibular system of the ear and the vomiting center of the brainstem. And so it decreases nausea and vomiting, and so this can be useful in patients who experience motion sickness as a result of being in a car or on the boat. So scopolamine is used for motion sickness. Benstropine acts predominantly in the central nervous system, but it, uh, but it acts in the striatum, in the basal ganglia. And so for this reason, it can be used in the treatment of tremors in patients with, uh, in patients with Parkinson disease. Then we have tropicamide, so this is used topically uh, um, on the eye. It inhibits M3, and so that causes medriasis and cycloplegia. Remember, cycloplegia is paralysis of, the, of those ciliary body muscles that essentially prevents elongation of the lens. And so this medication is useful in uh, doing fundoscopic exams, eye exams. So we can use either topical tropicamide or topical atropine. Then we have ipotropium, teotropium. So these are medications used in the treatment of asthma or COPD, and that's because they bind in the lungs, so we can inhale these. They will bind to M3 receptors in the lung, inhibiting them, causing bronchodilation and decrease in secretions. Then we have, glyco uh, then we have glycopyrrolate. Glycopyrrolate acts in the lungs and the gut, inhibiting M3. And so glycopyrrolate can be used by anesthesiologists before surgery, before intubation. Because what glycopyrrolate, what glycopyrrolate does is it binds to the lungs and it decreases airway secretions. And so that's useful for anesthesiologists because that prevents aspiration and aspiration pneumonia during the process of intubation. And glycopyrrolate can also be used in patients with gastric ulcers because it decreases secretions of gastric juice, gastric acid in the gut. Then we have oxybutynin. Oxybutynin is used for overactive bladder in patients who have 
uh, too much urge or too much frequency. And what it does is it blocks the contraction of the bladder and that can prevent these urge or frequency episodes. And finally, we have dicyclamine. Dicyclamine acts predominantly in the gut, and so it can prevent spasms because it decreases motility. So it inhibits M3 in the gut, decreasing motility, thereby decreasing spasms in patients with IBS, so irritable, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And finally, I want to finish off by briefly talking about toxins. So, uh, patients who like to garden can sometimes be exposed to belladonna alkaloids that are similar to atropine. And one common example is the Jimson weed that is found in the U.S. And so, if we, if we are exposed to the belladonna alkaloids such as Jimson weed, we're going to have too much atropine in the body, so too much anticholinergic in the body, and that can cause signs and symptoms that are opposite of this. So if you memorize these, the opposite of this means we have too much anticholinergics. And another way to memorize them is to use this mnemonic. So hot as a hare, dry as a bat, red as a beet, blind as a bat, mad as a batter. So if acetylcholine causes too much leakage in the body, then uh, too much anticholinergic activity, the opposite of too much acetylcholine means everything's going to be dry. So dry as a, uh, dry as a, um, so this should be dry as a bone, not dry as a bat. So basically, all the exocrine glands are going to decrease their production of things, and so we're not going to produce a lot of saliva, dry mouth, dry eyes, and so forth. We're going to be hot as a hair because we're not going to produce sweat from the sweat glands, and we're not going to be able to dissipate heat. Heat will accumulate, and that can even cause fever. So hot as a hair. And that, the, the increase in temperature and the inability to sweat will cause flushing of the face and the skin. And so red as a beet, that's flushing. Then blind as a bat means we're going to affect the M3s in the eye, call it, uh, causing medriasis. And that can actually affect our vision. And it will affect accommodation because we're going to have paralysis of the ciliary body muscle. And then mad as a batter. So a batter is somebody who basically... Um, is beating dough, and uh, when I beat dough, it's very hard, so I get angry, and so uh, that's mad as a batter. And then uh, mad means we're gonna develop things like delirium, agitation, confusion, so things of that nature.